So, uh, a minister was sitting around one evening talking to some college students, and they were talking about the nature of God. And of course, there were people who were um, who didn't believe in God at all. Students who were were atheists. And then there was one young man, and he said he thought that God was like a teddy bear, and would give him a great big hug whenever he needed it. And then there was another young woman, and she said, "Oh, I think of God as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Universe, and He is going to nail me to the wall." when Judgment Day comes. And at the end, as their discussion came to a conclusion, they decided that as long as a person's understanding of God didn't lead them to harm anyone else, then they could just believe whatever they wanted to believe. They said, God is whatever we think God is. One person's idea is as good as another person's idea. We shouldn't be judging anyone's religious ideas. Our scripture reading for this evening begins by saying that many people believed in Jesus because of the signs that they saw him do. And one of those people was Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, it says, in the dark, literally and probably figuratively too, and he is seeking out uh, Jesus and who Jesus is, just like many people today are seeking. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs apart from the presence of God. He says this because he has seen the signs that Jesus has done. And he says that what he believes about Jesus is that Jesus is a teacher who has come from God. And then over the course of their dialogue, Jesus corrects Nicodemus and tells him who he really is and what it really means to believe in him. Because apparently, it is important that what we believe about God. We cannot just believe whatever we want to believe about who God is if we claim to be Christians. So, you might want to turn in your bullets and read along with me as I read from John the chap chapter 3, the, uh, verses 1 through 17. You'll notice one scripture, one sentence in there that you're very familiar with, um, but I'll read you the context for that. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter a mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that, what we, speak about, that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen but you don't receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things, if I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the stake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, 
so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. May God's people say, thanks be to God. Let me invite you to bow your heads and pray for me this evening. Uh, and sharing this word with you as I pray for you in receiving it. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this Sunday is what we call Trinity Sunday. Uh, it's a Sunday in the Christian year when we are invited, encouraged to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity examine it and celebrate it. Now, this year, this Sunday, Trinity Sunday also happens to be on Father's Day, and so Steve's gonna be preaching about Father's Day on Sunday, and I thought that I would preach about the Trinity tonight. It's not a coincidence that the Trinity follows Pentecost Sunday. It's a week after Pentecost every year, and Pentecost is when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, a part of the Trinity. Now, we don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. We believe in God. But the God that we believe in as Christians is the triune God, the one living and true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or creator, redeemer, and sustainer. That's what Trinity means, the Trinity, Father, the creator, the author of salvation, the giver of life, uh, the generator of all that is, Son, Jesus, the Word made flesh, God in the flesh, the human one, the Christ, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit, the guide, the counselor, the sustainer, the comforter. We believe in the triune God. And understanding the doctrine of the Trinity will give us a better understanding of what it means to believe in this triune God. Theologian Shirley Guthrie uh, says this, faith in this God and lives shaped by faith in this God is what distinguishes Christians from people who do not believe in God at all and from other religious people whose faith and life is shaped by other world, other views of God. And so far from believing whatever we want to believe about God, like those students that I referenced at the beginning, what we believe about God is absolutely essential to our faith. Nicodemus apparently comes to Jesus and uh, believes that he's a great teacher. And then Jesus tries to teach him what it means to believe and who it is that he is believing in. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born anew. That's where we get that phrase of born again or born from above. Born anew is probably uh, a little more ambiguous and more ambiguous like the Greek word is as well. Uh, but for, for Nicodemus, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense to him. He doesn't get it. So Jesus goes on to tell him what it means to be born anew, to be born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus still doesn't get it. So Jesus said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. So on Trinity Sunday, the message that we receive from the passage in John about this uh, conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus is what we believe 
about God and the Son of God and the Holy Spirit and that it is of ultimate importance. We cannot believe just anything willy-nilly. As Christians, we're called to believe something very unique about God. Now, you may have heard of this phrase before, not one iota of difference. Have y'all heard that before? Not one iota of difference. It is usually used to refer to there not even being one small tiny difference between two or more things. Iota is a letter in the Greek alphabet, actually the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet, kind of similar to the I in, in our English language. It's, it just, it looks a little bit like an I. The history of that phrase, not one iota of difference, goes all the way back to the year 325 AD and the Council of Nicaea, when the doctrine of the Trinity, what we believe about God, was first fleshed out. You see, there were these two theologians, pastors, Athanasius and Arius, and they were trying to get, at, get to the nature of God, and they were talking about this with a council of church leaders. We've been having a lot of church meetings in the United Methodist Church lately, and we've been you know, debating a lot of things. Oh, if we would go back to debating the nature of God, something as significant and essential as that. But the question was this, was Jesus just another great prophet and teacher, like Nicodemus began by saying, or was Jesus God in the flesh, co-equal, co-eternal with God? And the difference was literally one iota. That's right. If every one on the council could agree whether or not to include just this one little iota, this one little iota letter in Greek, then everyone could go home and there would be peace and unity. This one little iota made all the difference in the meaning. See, there are two Greek words. Okay, Anna, come up here and help me. There are two Greek words. One, what's first? Oh, he's so good. One is homo Usius. Okay, see that? Homo Usius. You're doing a great job, Vanna. The other is Homo Usius. See, there's a difference of one little iota in there. You see that? That I right there is not in that one. So, Athanasius wanted to use the word, you can stay up for just a minute, homoousius, uh, to describe Jesus. It meant that Jesus was of the same substance as the Father, the Creator. And followers of Arius wanted to use the word homoousius, which means of like substance with the Father, the Creator. Only one letter difference, only one little iota, but a huge difference in meaning. Thank you, Anna. In the end, the council sided with Athanasius and affirmed that Jesus was the same substance with God. Jesus was equal to and eternal with God. That means that we believe in a triune God. God that is one substance and three persons is what we say. The three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are not three different gods, but they are one God with three different ways of, of being or th with three different beings or persons. One, one plus one plus one in this case does not add up to three. With the Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one, one being, one God. Now, you may ask, okay, so what's the big deal with believing in a Trinitarian God? What difference does it make? So let me tell you just three short things. It tells us who God is when we put our belief and trust and relationship 
and have a relationship with that triune God. First of all, it tells us that God is relational. God is not some distant being who puts everything in motion and then steps back and just lets it happen. No, God is relational. God is personal. God is first and foremost in relationship with God's self because God is not one person but three persons in one being, in one substance. So not three gods, mind you. We're not polyistic, but three persons, three ways of being in the Trinity. And from the very beginning, even before creation, God was in relationship, those three uh, persons in one substance, creator, Christ, and spirit. And because God is create, rela relational and we are created in the image of God, then we are created to be in relationship with God and in relationship with one another. The second thing that we know about the Trinity, about God through the Trinity, is that God is Savior. The doctrine of the Trinity reminds us that it is God who saves. That verse that you all know from this passage, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. God loves the world and came into the world to reconcile us with God. And because we believe in a triune God and that our God is one, then we can't believe that there's a difference in attitude between God the Father and Jesus Christ. God, our creator, is not some angry and vengeful God to be appeased by the Son who loves us and sacrifices for us. God is one God. Grace and love are the Father's idea as the Son's. God so loved the world. There's no separation of anger and mercy in the triune God. God loves us and saves us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the same saving love. And then our response to that love is to love God in return with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And finally, because we believe in a triune God, we know that God is always with us. Not only did God create us and save us, but God will never leave us alone. God will never abandon us. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was with God in the very beginning as the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. That's what it says in Genesis. And the Spirit will be with us always. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room and he told them, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides in you and will be with you. No matter what life may bring your way, we believe in a triune God who is with us and will never abandon us. This one God is the God of us, creator and father. This one God is God with us and for us as the son, the incarnate word, and this one God is in and among us as the Holy Spirit. Of course, it makes all the difference that we believe in God, and it makes all the difference what we believe about God, and it makes all the difference that there is not one iota of difference. So I want to close tonight by offering the Nicene Creed. It's the creed that the council decided upon in 325 AD. Listen to what it tells us about our God that we put our trust in and in whom, from whom we receive salvation. We believe 
in one God. The Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, <coughs> eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the Holy Catholic, which means universal here, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs>